Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. My name is Ali <coughs> and welcome to Bursa Malaysia's PLCT webinar entitled IOI Corporation Berhad, Development and Integration of EST Strategy. Before we go straight to the event, allow me a couple of minutes to walk everyone through some housekeeping for this event. As some of you might be aware, all attendances microphone have been set to mute. This is to prevent interruptions and allow for a smooth session throughout the event. We will have a written Q&A session, so please feel free to use the Zoom's Q&A function located at the bottom of the screen to write in your questions. Where we will have one of our, uh, where we will where I'll ha allow help to ask them on your behalf to Dr. Serena. So we are grateful here to have with us IOI Corporation Berhad, a constituent of Persa Malaysia's FUSI for Good Index, who also won the Gold Award in the Plantation category at the Edge Malaysia's ESG Award in 2022. In this webinar, we'll discover how IOI Corporation Berhad has successfully integrated ESG into its business operations and decision-making process. We'll also learn about the importance of ESG strategy, how to develop it effectively alongside real-world case studies showcasing successful development and integration. Before we begin, I would like to quickly introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Serena Ismail. Dr. Serena Ismail currently holds the position of Group Head of Sustainability, IOI Corporation Berhad. In her capacity, she is responsible for the corporate sustainability, which includes aligning the strategy and sustainability policies together with their implementation for the whole IOI Group Plantation and Manufacturing Division. Prior to this, she was the Global Director for the Intellectual Property Management at Emory Olio Chemicals, where she, her main responsibilities include IP strategy, valuation, and portfolio management. At the same time, she was also a business development and operations director for Emory Advanced Material, a subsidiary company of Emory, which specializes in the dispensation of nanocarbon in materials. She holds several patents in this field, and where she was also responsible for development for developing the business strategy for their patented technology, as well as oversee the operations side of this technology. So I, I would I don't want to uh, take much of your time, Doctor. So without further ado, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, let me just uh, make sure that I share my screen appropriately. Um, there you go. Um, so I hope everybody is seeing the proper screen. Okay, great. So again, thank you, Persa Malaysia, for having me to uh, share IOI's journey towards the in development and integration of our ESG strategy in our uh, business businesses and operation. Um, I'm really happy to share some of our uh, achievements, our challenges, and our pains, as well as our successes. So. Uh, let me just go ahead first to um, uh, you know in, in talk a little bit about um, IOI Corporation Bahar as an introduction. So as mentioned, we are a uh, plum, palm oil plantation uh, company. Um, uh, we are globally integrated, uh, sustainable palm oil group with both upstream and downstream operation and the plantation as well as the manufacturing, uh, including uh, refineries and oleochemical. 100% um, of our Malaysian plantations are both RSPO and MSPO certified. Uh, although for the RSPO, there about uh, there is still one small uh, area in Sarawak that we are still in the process of being certified under RSPO. Um, we are about 178,000 planted area. Um, and we have operations both in uh, Peninsula, Sabah, uh, Sarawak, as well as in Indonesia, in Kalimantan. Uh, our presence in Kalimantan is not as uh, uh, large. Um, um, and uh, we have an oleochemical capacity of about 780,000 metric tons a year with manufacturing facilities both in Malaysia and Germany. Um, I thought it will be important to also talk about our workforce. We have a total um, of about 24,000 uh, workforce, um, about 21,000, <coughs> excuse, of, excuse me, <coughs> about 21,000 of them are uh, migrant workers uh, and workers. Um, 
and about 2,900 of them are employees, uh, which exclude workers. So these are generally at the corporate level at HQ. And you can see that there is a breakdown on the workforce nationality here, and you can see uh, about 60% of our workers are from Indonesia, and they are basically manning a lot of our plantation areas. <coughs> Excuse me, I think I have a frog in my throat. So without further ado, let me go into the development of our ESG strategy. I think it's important to really look at uh, how we want to go about um, you know, developing this strategy. First and foremost, we are very much into sustainability. So I think it's important to understand that sustainability covers the whole aspects where ESG is part and parcel of sustainability. So when we started out at IOI, we set out with a sustainability vision. We had a vision in which we needed to commit to protect, rehabilitate and preserve the environment where we live in. We wanted to ensure that the economic and social well-being and health of our employees and their families, as well as the wider communities are safeguarded. We wanted to make sure that we are leading and innovating as well as embedding sustainability practices into our businesses. So with this vision being clearly articulated, we went about looking at how do we go about, uh, how do we uh, approach our sustainability then? The next step was to engage with our stakeholders and engaging with stakeholders doesn't only include our uh, external stakeholders, you must include our internal stakeholders because the internal stakeholders are the ones who's going to implement our sustainability approach. The external stakeholders are important because they give us context and issues and concerns that they perceive as uh, affecting the environment and, and the social well-being of the communities. Once we have already set out to engage with the stakeholders, both internal and external um, stakeholders, we understand what are the issues that we need to address, and then we set goals and we set out commitments. Once the goals and commitments are clear, we need to now establish the system and processes in order to implement the sets and goals. Once this has been set, established, and you started to implement, you, you just can't leave it as it is. You have to track the progress and you got to start reporting it. So this whole approach to sustainability embeds how we also start uh, uh, um, uh, uh, put in our ESG strategy. Um, to further support our vision and our approach to sustainability are our pillars of sustainability. We believe that the three pillars of sustainability, which is people, planet, and prosperity, these are very important together with partnership, enables us to be to, to understand the importance of all the different, different stakeholders per se in our journey towards uh, sustainability. So people, it's very important for us to take care of the people in order for them to be able to take care of the planet. Now, to, to take care of the planet, we need prosperity. We need the, because sustainability is not easy, it's not cheap, it's not um, simple. So we need prosperity and prosperity includes not just profit, but also innovation. These are the ideas that would help us to prosper as a company in order for us to feed uh, the people and the planet. Um, and we understand that sustainability is not a journey traveled alone. And this is where partnership with uh, involved stakeholders or stakeholders that has the, the, the most impact uh, in any operation, in anything that we do, will be part and parcel of the journey towards sustainability. We also understand that um, the development of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are 17 of them, are very important for the global um, prosperity and, and, and health. Um, so out of the 17, which has a, over 169 targets, and we know that there's no way that we can uh, look in all 169 targets, we actually selected the six most relevant. Now we chose two because to us, zero hunger is very important. We are an agricultural based company. So we feel that our contribution can help to reduce zero hunger. 
to reduce hunger. With, uh, we adopted uh, UN SDG 8 because this is part and parcel of economic health. Um, 12, which is one of the, the basis of uh, um, a production and a responsible consumption. 13, climate action, because we are an agricultural company and we definitely are affected by climate change and affects climate change. And finally, 15, uh, which is life on land, since this is where we operate. And 17, which is very much in line with our pillars of sustainability, which is partnership for goals. In looking at <clears throat> sustainability at IOI, we believe that governance is the basis for uh, our social and environmental practices. So the integration of governance in our practice are essential to ensure that there is transparency and, um, and um, <coughs> accountability. So we have, for example, the, uh, uh, the, the sustainability steering, group sustainable steering committee, where we have our group managing director and chief executive, as well as the board of directors um, together with, with me as the group head of sustainability, um, uh, working together with all the necessary functions and business units in IOI. And this is at this, at this um, uh, steering committee, uh, this is where we set sustainability strategies, priorities and targets. We consider sustainability when exercising our duties. Um, and this is, and, and the management of the, uh, of the, the strategic management is driven by the, this senior management. So one of the things that we have committed, for example, is to eliminate all forms of forced labor. So to do this, we have developed a code of conduct on ethical recruitment and responsible employment with an approach guided by all the international standards like ILO, uh, United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, uh, free and fair labor in palm oil production, um, and of course the UNGC on human rights, labor, environmental anti-corruption. So, with this is the sort of discussions that we generally have at the Group Sustainable Steering Committee, committee. and <clears throat> we are also overseen by the Sustainability Advisory Panel, which consists of um, um, uh, customers, uh, consists of um, uh, industry experts, uh, also uh, NGOs. And we also have an internal part where the Group Sustainable Steering um, uh, the the group head will be working together with all the partner all the uh, sustainability uh, personnel within the company so this is how we integrate and embed sustainability at IOI with the proper governance to ensure transparency and uh, and accountability so looking at how we develop and implement ESG strategy the first thing is to conduct materiality assessment. And this is where we have this intern, the stakeholder engagement that I, I, I mentioned earlier. And this, when we have a uh, uh, stakeholder engagement with the necessary components of uh, materiality, for example, customers, suppliers, NGOs, communities, uh, uh, government agencies, so depending on which stakeholders are necessary for you to understand uh, how you impact the environment and social and society, you identify which needs to be prioritized in terms of which issues are most concern to the stakeholders. Once you've done that, you establish a baseline. You establish this by determining how well our existing program are working. Is there a gap that needs to be addressed? And once you've done that, you start again identifying the proper objectives and the goals. And these objectives and the goals will also create this awareness of what are missing within the organization that we need to address uh, in terms of um, addressing this issue uh, so that we can uh, plan and strategize accordingly. So once you have done all this, this, you can create an ESG roadmap. So, for example, when you look at the specific social issue, you will you can develop the necessary framework to uh, meet that requirement. And again, after you have 
done your framework, you've done your processes, then you do your action plan and your KPIs. Now, the action plan and KPIs are important because KPIs gives that accountability. An action, action plan ensures that the strategy is not just sitting there, but actually being implemented. So this is how we develop and implement our ESG strategy. So this is a kind of like a broad-based understanding of how we approach it. I will continue on and show to you how we do this. So as I've mentioned, uh, these are our material sustainability matters and assessment. When we did our identification of sustainable team material matters, there are over 44 um, uh, materiality uh, that we have considered that are necessary or that has been uh, shared with us by our stakeholders. And we went ahead uh, yearly or every two years, generally every two years, we would approach our stakeholders and re-engage with them to identify which one has priorities. Because, you know, material, material assessment are based on what is most uh, important at that specific time. Sometimes the issue of um, uh, you know, deforestation is top. Sometimes it's the issue of labor. So we need to understand which is more important. If you have already addressed that issue, maybe that issue is no longer important. And this is where you have the stakeholder engagement. Once you have prioritized each of the matrix, uh, we need to have validation of the material. And this is where you talk about governance. We have identified the based on uh, the feedback that we get from our in, our in, our stakeholders. We have identified, for example, ten most or in this case, um, uh, ten most uh, relevant sustainability matters, and we have looked at it and we've considered why we have chosen it. And this is this matter then is presented to the board and the the, the uh, group managing director for validation. Um, they will then look at it and discuss and understand why we are, uh, what, whether this is the highest risk, the lowest risk, whether this is something that is uh, that needs to be addressed. So as you can see, we put safety and health as number one. And this has always been the case. We have always, as our stakeholders, this is always has always I mean, for the past few years, safety and health has always been number one in our sustainability matters. Um, the, so in the, the second one was climate change and um, uh, circular economy. And this is very much in line with the fact that we are going towards our net zero uh, journey. So you can see that the our materiality is uh, chosen on the basis of whether or not this is relevant or whether this is uh, going to impact our business and our uh, stakeholders as a whole. Once we've done that, we do this, uh, we uh, give transparency by reporting. So a lot of this information you can find in our NSC report. Uh, this is part and parcel of governance again, because we believe that without governance, the E and the S cannot be monitored. What cannot be, uh, cannot be measured and what cannot be measured cannot be monitored, right? So in the next step, uh, we looked at some of the uh, response and effective implementation. We looked after we have looked at the material matter, we asked why is this material matter mat important to our business? Why this material matter is important to our environment and society? And we link this to our United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and our capital inputs. We also link this to our stakeholders and also to our corporate risk. You can see that all this are all interrelated. You, when we make this, this judgment or, this, or, or, or assessment of why this material matters, these are the important questions that we post. And you can see that there are <clears throat> several matters that we have divided between environmental, social, and, and the, the governance. And including governance, we have included economic side because if you recall, prosperity is very much part and parcel of sustainability journey. Without proper prosperity, we people cannot take care of the environment. And so it's, a, it's, like, a, it's a, like a circle, you know, and each of them needs to be balanced appropriately. You cannot just, you know, concentrate on the planet without taking care of the people. 
You cannot take care of the people and the planet without making sure that the company is prosperous. Prosperity here is not just about profit. Prosperity here is about sharing the, uh, the wealth that has been um, achieved by the company to ensure that both people and planet are taken care of. And that to me is a more humane way of approaching uh, the three Ps. So just as uh, uh, overall here, I'm just showing you IOI sustainability agricultural approach because we are an agricultural based company. You can see that there are the issues that we have put uh, up front and center are like, for example, reduction of GHG emission, uh, counter climate change. Uh, you want to create a healthy soil and nurture biodiversity. This is all part and parcel of our agricultural, uh, 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 you know, background and 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 operation. Uh, in other words, and and then you look into revitalizing local economies and meat rising depend, and this is very much part and parcel of the people side. And then when you look at the improved nutrition and achieve better yields, this is also part of how we want to make sure that the people, the, the people part and the net zero uh, um, uh, zero hunger of UN SDG uh, 2 is being addressed. So you can see that in all our approach and our uh, um, uh, um, uh, assessment, it is all interrelated with our uh, UN SDG goals. It's uh, related to our um, uh, visions. It's uh, related to our uh, people and uh, pillars of prosperity, pillars of sustainability, and 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 it's all interlinked so that it makes into a cohesive fabric of um, uh, that we are working towards uh, in terms of sustainability. Now, looking at how we integrate. Uh, ESG in our social practice. This is the S part of ESG. Now, as you can, uh, as you are aware, we are a plantation company. Um, part of our commitment is to uh, try to er eradicate forced labor. And under the, 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 the 11 indicators of forced labor, of course, uh, you know, we look at amenities, uh, you look at uh, the, the, the health uh, you look at uh, uh, removal of uh, child labor. So in our facilities and amenities for our plantation workforce, uh, we have built houses and uh, um, for the, our workers, our, and we have have healthcare uh, to ensure that uh, within the plantation, to ensure that if there's any uh, mild sickness, like, you know, like fever or something, you know, not, nothing really, uh, of course, serious like cancer. But, you know, we have clinics within the plantation to address normal, you know, flus and that sort of things. In terms of education, why do we have education within our plantation? In Sabah, for example, we have families with children. We wanted to make sure that the children are not uh, are given the necessary capability, necessary um, accessibility to education. So IOI is uh, in fact one of, uh, it's the largest uh, plantation uh, who provides uh, education to the workers, of, to the children's, to our children's workers in, uh, um, uh, in, uh, in Sabah. <coughs> uh, we also provide teachers uh, and, and uh, working with Humana, uh, we have teachers um, and we also provide vans and school buses to transport our children's, um, uh, our workers' children to the uh, education, uh, educational facilities um, in Sabah. Uh, so this is very uniquely uh, happening in Sabah because uh, in Peninsula, most of our workers uh, are uh, migrant workers who are single. Uh, not uh, and and no families, but in Sabah, most of our workers are uh, family. Uh, they have uh, you know children, and this is where we wanted to make sure that child labor, which is one of the uh, uh, one of the issues that has been faced by a lot of uh, other plantations, um, are not exposed to the possibility of working in the estates. Uh, the other facilities that we include are house of worship, uh, sports facilities, um, you know, um, and uh, we even, for example, have multi-purpose courts. Uh, we have also provided uh, what we call a plant your own food initiative 
where we have put aside a certain amount of areas for our workers to plant their own food. And this was extremely successful, especially during our um, during COVID, when we had issues of our workers not being able to leave the estates because of you know under under uh, quarantine and and that sort of things. So um, these are some of our policies and guidelines to prevent forced labor. We are, first and foremost, we have our sustainable palm oil policy. The sustainable palm oil policy covers policies covering not just on the social aspects, also the environmental aspects, also the governance aspect. So you can see that in the, 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 the policy, our sustainable palm oil policy, we have uh, respect and uphold rights of all workers, freedom of association, uh, eliminate all forms of forced labor, uh, no retention of workers' document. These are all part and parcel of the ILO's forced labor indicator. And so we are we have put that as part of our policy, strongly worded with no um, uh, you know uh, with no doubts about what we are committed to in terms of human rights and workplace under the sustainable palm oil policy. So we have also related policies and procedures. These are guidelines to uh, to and to uh, make it easier for implementation. Uh, we have grievance procedure, which is very important to in terms of remediation of any issues that is being faced by our workers. Uh, we also have specific guidelines to address, for example, foreign workers recruitment, uh, how to ensure the passports of uh, our foreign workers are being uh, safeguarded. Uh, we have uh, guidelines to provide uh, about providing basic amenities, and these are things that I've discussed earlier, uh, about how to handle harassment, uh, about occupational safety, health, and hygiene policy, uh, workers' work verification guidelines, extremely important, because a lot of workers feel that they, you know, when they work, they're not, uh, they want to make sure that, you know, if they work eight hours, they are being paid for eight hours. If they are being, if they have overtime, they, you know, that the overtime is being recorded. So this workers' work verification guideline was very important to ensure that the workers are able to verify that the number of hours that they work, are, they are being paid accordingly. Now, looking at the labor implementation and monitoring, there are three phases of employment for our workers. We have the pre-employment phase, the first phase, and this is, happens at the start at the source country generally. This is where you look into how do we go about doing ethical recruitment and we monitor that, that uh, aspects of the um, pre-employment part. This is where we monitor our recruitment agents to make sure that they undertake the no recruitment fee that we have uh, put in place since 2017. Uh, make sure that our workers that we are going to be hiring are aware they're going to be hired to work as a plantation worker. In other words, they know that they have to be in an estate. Uh, they know what our oil palm uh, uh, looks like. Um, uh, they know that they are supposed to be working in a plantation estate, not in, say, for example, a hotel as a service industry. So these are all made clear. They, we also share with them our policies, our guidelines, their rights, so that they know that if anything, if the uh, grievance mechanism, all this are being discussed at a pre-employment phase. Once we go into the uh, phase two, which is the employment phase, this is where we looked into their, uh, we, we give them training about what they need to be doing. Uh, we give them uh, training in terms of, uh, you know, adjustment to living in an estate. These are all done during the employment phase when they first come in. At the end of their contract, that is where we have the organizational monitoring. We looked into whether the workers, um, you know, uh, are properly, uh, ex uh, you know, stand, you know, they they go back. You know, we we make sure that they have their flights to go back. All this are being done at the end of the employment. Um, there are some major social initiatives that we have uh, uh, implemented since the uh, you know, past two years, even during COVID. The first thing that was most important was the implementation of the SAP ERP system. And this was really, really important because it enables standardization on workers 
working hours, overtime, headcounts, employment status. This cuts the possibility of our workers uh, of any manipulation of their wages. We also introduced what we call the digital grievance application for IOI Mustra. This is a 24-7 app for the workers. Uh, they can report their grievances either anonymously or if they want to register, it's uh, all open to uh, what they require. And this is really important on, because just to be clear, the digital grievance application is not the only ways or means in which our workers can uh, uh, share their, their grievances. We have uh, you know, different channels, like for example, through emails, through WhatsApp, uh, through hot hotlines, um, uh, through Green Book. I, I'm not sure whether you, are, you know that, but in the estates, they have this sort of Green Book where they you know, just sort of write in their, their grievances. So if, for example, if they have the house is leaking, you know, they can just write it and it will quickly uh, uh, address. And they also have what we call the Employee Consultative Council. And this is where representatives of the workers uh, bring up uh, grievances to the, the management in the Joint consul, Consultative Council um, and uh, so that issues can be also ironed out. So there are many, many channels for our workers to address their grievances. Um, looking at direct online interviews, uh, this is part of our pre-employment process. We, during uh, COVID, what we did was we had a Zoom interview with our workers when our workers are still in the source country to ensure that, uh, you know, they understand that they have been briefed on their rights, they understand our policies, they know that they're going to be coming to a plantation to work in a plantation estate. Um, we also have um, digital e-wallet system, and this is to also uh, enable ease of uh, uh, disbursement uh, to our workers, uh, their, their wages uh, through a digital banking platform. Uh, on top of that, we also have what we call uh, online assessment for pre-alert grievance system. Uh, this is to have a sort of a a uh, year-long survey on our workers to see if there's any additional gaps regarding their welfare and well-being. Uh, and finally, we had a pledge to ILO in 2021 to eliminate child labor by, uh, um, you know, uh, enhancing further the education uh, uh, provision that we have provided to our children of our workers in uh, Sabah, a zero cost full day education for our workers, uh, which we started, uh, which I think uh, we have fully implemented uh, since last, uh, last quarter uh, of last year. Um, finally, on the, the, the environmental part, I think the integration of climate change action is the biggest part that we have put in. Uh, we have a pledge for climate change action um, and this climate change action pledge. There are three parts that we are very, very uh, concerned about, which is that, you know, we take action on any issues raised, making it known that the issues are being addressed. This is a sustainability side. And we want to make sure that there's no greenwashing. So we are transparent about our key decision. And this is where the governance come into play and engagement, listening to our stakeholders and understanding the arguments and demands when we make any key decisions. This is how we start our climate change action. And our first KPI was uh, in 2019, we introduced our KPI to reduce GHG emission intensity of 40% for scopes one and two. And uh, I'm happy to say that we have been, uh, we are right now very much on, on target. And uh, last year we uh, set out our net zero uh, carbon uh, um, uh, um, commitment where we wanted to make sure that by 2040, covering both scopes one, two, and three, uh, that we will meet net zero. In the interim, the medium term, is that we will meet uh, uh, the carbon neutral for GHG emission scopes one and two by 2030. So I'm happy to say that so far things are going on uh, 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 on target. 
And uh, these are some of the actions that we take to uh, un undertake for the net zero economy. Uh, we, all, we include reduction and removal, including storage commitment and increased productivity. We adopt application of technologies uh, and also to manage the greenhouse gas emission from our supply chain. So going quickly, some of the best practices that we have is protection of our set sites. Uh, we have a no deforestation, uh, no planting on no planting on uh, peat uh, through water management and fire prevention. We implement waste management through our circular economy, which is uh, and this is where we have methane capture. Uh, we have the repurposing of our oil palm trunks to make uh, uh, you know boards to for maybe application like the furniture and chairs and that sort of thing. And we adopt regenerative agriculture to enhance our soil biodiversity. And we monitor our, monitor our operations for source of GHG emission to develop actions in order for us to reduce or remove uh, those sources of GHG emission. And this involves decarbonization. Uh, the first thing, of course, is the, the implementation of responsible land use planning, precision agriculture, uh, the use of better planting material to, so that we can increase our yields uh, and thereby be more productive per hectare. Um, we improve energy efficiency. Uh, we adopt renewable energy, and this is where we have solar, cogen, power plants, methane capture, um, and we use uh, uh, you know, application of advanced digital tools uh, and data analytics for us to identify uh, areas in which we can, for example, increase efficiency and automation of our uh, manufacturing uh, facilities. Uh, looking at managing the supply chain this is really important because this is where scope three is. The first thing is to introduce climate-related procurement standard and principle. We look into how to promote uh, resource efficiency and lower impact on the environment. And we introduce a lot of uh, awareness and capacity building with suppliers. Uh, this is part and parcel of uh, what we are doing. Uh, we are talking to uh, the stakeholders as a general. And if you're part and parcel of our suppliers, uh, this is part of our awareness and capacity building with regards to net zero, our net zero journey. And we also establish uh, a green supplier selection. In other words, you know, uh, suppliers who who, for, who are very much in line towards net zero will have a better um, you know access to us as a, as their customer. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's all for now. Uh, I will leave it up to you guys if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Serena, for the enlightening session. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in, uh, but maybe I'll just kick that some of the questions first. Uh, we have one question from uh, Ralph Dixon, who is asking how, uh, how is IOI intending to tackle the issue of supply chain emissions for SMEs? If you don't mind, Dr. Okay, so as I say, uh, in, in, in the last slide that I've uh, um, uh, mentioned, I think the most important part first is to, for SMEs, is for them to be aware what net zero is. I mean, I have been speaking to a lot of uh, uh, suppliers. Some of them are not even familiar with what is greenhouse gas. So I think the first part towards tackling that is that capacity building and awareness. And uh, for example, okay. what we are doing right now is um, uh, in March, 20, March 21st, uh, which is uh, part of Earth Month, we will be having a sort of a webinar that we'll be opening to our uh, um, uh, interested stakeholders um, to sit and uh, listen for about the, uh, you know, with, uh, with a, a group of panel uh, from IOI uh, about what are the things that we're doing so that they can learn what are the initiatives that we are going to be uh, doing, what we have, how we go about, uh, you know, going towards net zero. So this, this is the first thing I think, once you've tackled that and they know what it is, then so you, you got to know what the animal is before you can even address how to, uh, you know, um, uh, deal with that animal. So in this case, I think that's the first step that we're doing. 
And after that, once they have done that, then we will also put into place, you know, if you are following it towards net zero, you will be like a preferred supplier, you know, that, that sort of thing. So this is like a carrot uh, kind of approach uh, to our suppliers. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Doctor. Um, earlier on, you mentioned um, about how on tracking the implementation of the, all for the progress. As all of us are aware, what gets measured gets managed, or as you would like say, monitored. So we have a question from Marina E. Um, I am from the Marine Services. Question about measurable goals. We set a KPI, for example, less fuel consumption of our vessel, but the fuel depends on our business activities. So there are external factors, variables, they are, they are always changing. When we put three years data in a row, it doesn't give much meaning. Um, so the numbers keep changing because we use a lot more fuel in the vessels and a lot more carbon footprint as we also fly people more often. I understood that we can justify the data with this, but in the end of the day, uh, I, I, it's hard for us to use the data to achieve anything meaningful. Um, any insights or advice from Marina, Doctor? Okay, so yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, if you understand, uh, when we report our greenhouse gas, we report against intensity. So that means we are not reporting against absolute because absolute is going to be very difficult. You know, okay. if you have a higher yield in, uh, in, 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 in uh, our plantation, for example, if you have a higher yield, you will, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, refine more then you know your emission will be more however if you base that against your productivity that's where you get intensity that's why it's reported in intensity and it makes sense right so for us what we're doing is that we have put in place uh, factors that would manage that uh, emission accordingly so for example we have uh, um, um, our fruit bunches, which we uh, go through the mill and we produce the oil. When we produce the oil, the more oil we produce, right? The more waste we, we produce, which is the palm oil mill effluent, and that produces methane. So the more we produce, the more methane we, we, we produce, okay, that waste. But what we did was we put a methane capture to capture that methane that is produced from the waste. And we use that waste now to run our mills that will also reduce our operation. So what I'm trying to say is that you are aware that you're going to be uh, increasing the your, your um, uh, emission with increased uh, activity. Mm. So make sure instead of using fossil fuel to run your, your uh, transportation, use biofuel. You know, use uh, LNG, use a renewable source of energy and thereby you will reduce your, uh, so because, you know, I mean, uh, reduction of emission shouldn't, should be part and parcel of your pathway towards uh, re, uh, net zero. It's not just, uh, you know, it's not just uh, removal, but it's also reduction. Thank you, Doctor. Um, earlier you mentioned on the three P's, people, planet, and prosperity, it reminds me of the of the BFM segment on sustainability. Uh, how do you go about integrating ESG strategy into your business operations and decision making process? And sort of like, what challenges did you face in 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 this particular journey? Okay, <clears throat> you know, I think as I, I mentioned very much very early in our this our uh, in in my presentation. The most important part about sustainability, about ESG, anything that you do is about mindset. We need to make sure that this journey is gen journey traveled together. So within a corporation, the most important part was this mindset change. We must not only have the top down, we also have to have, you know, bottom up. Because at the end of the day, Policies can be introduced, but the one that's going to be implemented is on the ground. Therefore, you need them to be together on the journey as well as much as you need the top management to support what you're doing. 
So that is the main challenge. You know, when we started our journey, the top management was very much, uh, uh, you know, supporting this whole journey of sustainability of ESG. But we needed to make sure that our people on the ground understand the importance of it. So the first thing we did was to ensure that we have a lot of engagement with our stakeholders, our internal stakeholders, understand their issues so that when we introduce the policies, the policies are something that they understood, that they, they, they said it makes sense, that they can implement. So that's the, that's the thing. That's the first challenge that you have. Once you've done that, then it's just a matter of identifying what are the issues and then implementing it. So that's that's the most important challenge. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, we have a question from Mr. Faris Manap. Um, how do the workers report that there are any disputes on their salary? Do you, does IOI provide any pay slips? And if yes, how about the transparency on the salary breakdown? Um, yeah. Absolutely. As I mentioned, we have uh, introduced the SAP ERP system where it tracks down all the hours that they have put in. And if they need the breakdown, the breakdown can be given. There's no issue. And uh, and, and since this is uh, generated uh, digitally, automatically, it's it cannot be manipulated by the estate managers, by the supervisors, by assistant, anyone cannot be, because it is, it is generated at the HQ level. Uh, so that can be easily done. And, and, and as I mentioned earlier, we have what we call the workers verification guideline. So the workers verification guideline is a, is a form in which the workers uh, put down, the, the hours are being put down. And then the workers go through it, they verify, it, they sign it, and that number now goes into the SAP. So, so the workers verify that this is the number of hours that they're working. And there's no manipulation. So this is this is part and parcel of how we introduce that issue of wage manipulation, uh, or, or uh, you know that it's very much a part of the forced labor indicator. I understand. Thank you so much. I think that that helps to provide that check and balance between both the employees as well as AOI as an employee as well. Yes. Um, question from Hans Athate. I hope I got your uh, pronounce it right. Um, is AOI or looking at carbon credit schemes? Well, we do. I mean, uh, there's nothing that, you know, I, I, you know, more, most important for us is to ensure that we get the net zero. If there's any extra, of course, you know, I mean, that's not something that we will not look at. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's an opportunity. That's why I'm saying this net zero is not just, it's not just about, uh, you know, expenses, but it's also an opportunity. You know, if you are well poised to meet this challenge, you might be in a position to provide that credit. Uh, if you recall on the net zero target that we have, we have reforestation with minimal offset. If we can make sure that uh, our reforestation uh, activities on initiative provides a lot of sequestration, that's a possibility that we can uh, identify as credit. Our methane capture, we have excess methane. That's a possibility of a credit too. So yes, we are looking at it. Thanks so much, Dr. Um, another question is, on that, uh, how does IOR incorporate forced labor criteria in their suppliers' is audit? Uh, can mm -hmm. and if you can share what sort of criteria is used by IOI? Okay, with the suppliers, our commodity marketing uh, and their team uh, work together with the suppliers uh, through what we call um, the uh, uh, T4T uh, tools for transformation. This is where. We identify all our suppliers, and once we have identified, we share with them our practices. We share with them our policies, our procedure, and uh, and they can also uh, they will write down what what is lacking. You know what are the gap analysis that they have. So, for example, if they're not familiar with forced labor indicator, then we will go and. Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, talk to them about what is forced labor, how do you detect forced labor, that sort of things. The same thing, that's what we're going to do also with the net zero journey. You know, we share with them what, how are the ways in which you can uh, reduce your greenhouse gas emission. 
Now, it is important for us that our suppliers reduce their greenhouse gas emission because under scope three, their emission becomes our emission. So it is a win-win situation for us <clears throat> to make sure that our suppliers are in the know of how to go about uh, you know, addressing some of the issues that are uh, being faced by IOI and everyone in the industry. Thank you, Doctor. Um, a question by Mr. Ken Meng Lim. Dr. Shurina, how is IOI managing scope three of your GHG emission? Um, there is a, a very wide stakeholders uh, in the whole value chain. And I, I, is IOI uh, conducting an audit on the scope three data? Scope three data? Uh, audit, is it? Sorry, uh, sorry, audit, yes. Uh, audit on the uh, scope three data. Okay, you know, as, as I mentioned, uh, if you look into our net zero journey, mm. our concentration is very much on scope one and scope two first, our own operation, and making sure that we can meet that 2030 target. Uh, in the meantime, as I said, the, the steps that we are doing is just to get our suppliers to be on board first. It's too much for them to go under a, a greenhouse gas audit, you know, scope three audit. It's, it's not that simple. Just to give you an example, in order for you to understand your greenhouse gas emission, you have to understand which operation emits what. In other words, you have to monitor for your operation, what are the operations that uh, contribute to its greenhouse gas. So in other words, your suppliers must have a baseline. And to do a baseline study, you need to know all your operation and how much, for example, land use change contributes towards greenhouse gas, how much your, your, your effluent uh, emits methane. I mean, all this needs to be measured. Again, without being measured, it cannot monitor. So before they can even go there and we want to, to audit them, they have to understand what is it they're doing. Okay, so it's a little bit too, uh, you know, too soon, for especially the small and medium players. You know, these are these are companies that do not have the kind of resources yeah. uh, to be able to understand the complexity of uh, uh, net zero. Thank you, Doctor. Um, another question by Ralph. In light of the recent criticism of various forestry projects by the Guardian newspaper, what are your views on using removal credits to offset those hard to abate emissions? Okay, well, I, you know, I can't talk about other companies and, and all this, but what we do know is this. Um, we are an RSPO certified company. We are an MSPO certified company. Uh, as an RSPO certified company, we have to be assessed on our ACVs, our high conservation value areas, our conservation areas, our high carbon stock. These areas are all set aside, okay? And these are audited by th third parties. And if there's any fire, any decimation, any land clearance, we will be subject to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, our certification. Therefore, for us, what we have reported has been audited. So that's why I remember the pledge for our climate change action initiative, no greenwashing. That's exactly what we are trying to do. We want to make sure that okay, we are very transparent. We have this amount of hectares put set aside for conservation. This set, this areas that we can rehabilitate uh, to increase its uh, its sequestration uh, capability and its biodiversity. These are initiatives that we are working on. So under the Climate Change Action Initiative, for example, we have been working with uh, under what we call the Relief Project, where we are doing reforestation along the uh, where where we operate on the uh, Kinabatangan in Sabah. So the reforestation will further enrich the area that has been, you know, not, you know, by, by and we don't just enrich it by, by uh, you know, um, planting any kind of trees. We are very careful about the kind of trees that we put to make sure that it is part and parcel of the ecosystem. So that it supports the biodiversity, so that we don't uh, 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 in, uh, introduce inv uh, invasive species, for example, that would be yeah. detrimental to the ecosystem. So all this we are doing it very carefully. So I'm not sure about what other companies or other corporation are doing, but we are very careful about doing this, and we are making sure that we report accordingly in our annual system report. Thank you so much, Doctor. 
Um, a question by Mr. Christopher. A good day, doctor. I am from an office furniture manufacturing SME. Uh, can you please provide some advice for SMEs regarding three matters? Number one, uh, challenges to find reliable and accessible emission factors database suitable for the Malaysian context. <laughs> Number two, <laughs> assessment of suppliers regarding human and labor rights by questionnaires and other means. So to ensure that we are, they are able to address all uh, issues and also cooperation of suppliers to participate and remedi remediate. And last but not least, to planning and execution of sustainability initiatives and strategy under a one-man show uh, versus a formal team study. I think sort of like goes back to what you were alluding to earlier about <laughs> saying that for SMEs, I mean, the playing field is a bit different, <laughs> but please, doctor, if you may. Okay, I, you know, it is, it is, I, I, I really sympathize with the small players because, uh, or the one man show, as they say, it, you know, I mean, it is a very, very difficult journey that you will have to go, but uh, it is a well deserved journey. Okay. Uh, it will make your company more sustainable. Now, let's look at how we go about doing this. Again, um, uh, you know, about your suppliers. You know, if you're small, your suppliers are even smaller. So <laughs> I think that will be a lot easier in terms of, uh, you know, uh, engaging with them and seeing whether both of you could work together to meet the requirements that you both need in order to move forward. You know, um, it's and, and the number of suppliers that you have will be also smaller. So, so it is in accordance. The first thing you have to do is you've got to understand what is it that you want to do. If you want to do social, your forced labor indicators, you understand what the forced labor indicators are. You look at your, your the first thing you do is look at your workers, all right? Are they uh, uh, isolated? Are they abused? Did you withheld the document? All those are all requirements of forced labor, okay? And the thing that we are trying to do is we understand uh, you know, the, the, the small players do not uh, have this concept or understanding of the formality. They might know intrinsically, but not the formality of it. So this is where we have capacity building. So my advice to you is that if you're a small player, ask, ask the person that you are supplying to, to help you with their journey. So, so it's like a cascading, uh, um, you know, effort. So you got you got to work with your 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 customers to say that look I'm going to supply to you I want to make sure that I am free of forced labor I'm I'm net zero this is what uh, helped me to do this you know and which is exactly what we are doing with our suppliers that's I think that's the best way to do it getting consultants to try and get you to do sometimes you know it can be a very expensive and very difficult for you to implement. Thank, thank you so much. And especially, you, you hit it right to the nail, especially on the last point on the hiring consultant. It's a bit difficult for SMEs, given the resource constraints that they have, as opposed to um, larger organizations. Um, we have a question by an, an, an anonymous, um, Dr. Serena. Tracking ESG performances can be quite taxing. Does IOI have an online data collection system or platform aligned with GRI requirements to ease data collection? visualization and facilitate auditing or assurances? Okay. All right. So as I said, we are an RSPU certified. Um, currently, what we do have is not yet automized. Uh, we are looking at digital platforms to convert what we have been doing uh, on a very, very uh, taxing, very, very manual intensive. Uh, currently, what happens is that every estate input the data and we collect them quarterly and we analyze them using a sort of a, uh, you know, sort of a uh, Excel kind of thing. So we are looking to transfer that into a digital platform because that would make it easier because this is uh, something that we'll be tracking uh, throughout the, the operation throughout the coming years. Yes. So yes, we, we are looking to, currently there are a lot of, uh, a lot on the, on, uh, on offer, but uh, not all of them actually meets our requirements. Thank you, Doctor. Um, and a question for another attendee. Hi, Doctor, if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned that 2040 is IOI's target 
to meet net zero? Is this target still feasible considering the SMEs of your supply chain, as you mentioned, may not even know what GHG is at present? Okay, currently now it's 2023. We have 17 years. I think <laughs> I think our our suppliers should be able to kind of catch up with uh, doing this. You know, uh, again, uh, it is not when it, it's uh, it, it is. You know, I mean, this is not an alternative. If the suppliers want to continue working with players like uh, us, you need to be on that same journey because uh, as time goes, the cost of your greenhouse gas emission it's going to cost you money. Yep. Uh, you know, if you go to uh, some countries, they already impose that cost uh, yep. of emission. So it's not if it's when. Definitely, Doctor. Especially with the uh, upcoming introduction or implementation of the carbon border pricing adjustment, um, it's more critical for all the supply chains, all the suppliers to also be part of this ESG journey. Absolutely. Um, a question by the attendee, what sort of technology is being deployed at 5G, IoT, by OI to help capture ESG-related data and report them to the ESG committee? How often are they recorded and reported for action plan? Okay, as I say, you know, we started this journey in 20, 2016. We started the baseline study so that uh, our, our, our baseline is based on 2015. So we have started this journey since 2015. And, and, and as I mentioned, currently the, 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 the um, uh, information are being recorded in a manual. Of course, there are means to measure it. You know, I mean, uh, how much methane is being, uh, um, uh, you know, um, released from the POME, you know, how much is being released uh, through our operation and the manufacturing, all those are being all those are being uh, monitored and 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 measured. But you're right; we require this to be digitalized. And uh, currently, there's a lot of uh, um, technology that is capable of doing it, and we still have not uh, put all of them in place. So uh, at this point, it's it's not going to be uh, something that we can share uh, about what kind of technology we're using. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, so one of the questions from the attendee, I was wondering, how does IOR incorporate all the re reporting requirements? You have your TCFT, GRI, CPD, and Prombosa. <laughs> and how does this impact the implementation on the ground? Oh, <clears throat> okay. Again, as I say, it's a very, very long journey. You know, we, as I, you know, we started our baseline management baseline for our emissions in 2015. We only committed the Climate Change Action Initiative in 2019. And that shows that journey. And when we committed the 2019, we didn't even commit to do TCFD until 2021. And in 2021, we had, after we are very clear about what is it that we are doing? We 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 uh, undertook uh, to have someone look at all our operation to look at the physical risks that we are being exposed to, as well as the transition risks that we are exposed to, and then only we understand them. What are the parts that we need to address in terms of risks? In terms of what we can mitigate? Uh, what are the opportunities that we can have in order to? You know, uh, take that uh, uh, that that issue, and it becomes not an issue, and it actually becomes an opportunity. So it is a very long journey. You know, TCFD was uh, very useful for us because what it did was it identified to us where are our physical risks, and it enables us to quantify that in a more um, articulate manner to be presented to the board so that the board understood what is the issue and the risk and thereby letting them understand that this is a, mat a, this is a matter that needs to be taken seriously. It is very difficult. There's a lot of things that you need to look at. GRI, for example, have a lot of uh, you know, uh, uh, requirements that you need to go into it. But it does, the thing about GRI is very systematic. It tells you what are the parts that you need to look at so that you can disclose. Now, for you to disclose it, you have to understand what is it that you're disclosing and thereby you intrude that into your operation. 
Thank you, Doctor. Um, another question from Carmen. Dear Doctor, may I, since you mentioned that the, you started the works in 2016 and you only introduced it in 2019, um, Carmen is asking, may I ask, in this journey, uh, it, were there any resist, resistance faced in IOI sustainability journey internally and from your supply chain? And oh. was it yes? And how does your team manage it? Thank you. Engage, engage, engage. <laughs> That's the only thing. You know, humans sometimes have a resistance to change. What we have to understand is the only constant in your life is change. So the thing that you need to do is you need to talk to them in not in sometimes that, you know, if you don't this, if you don't do this, this is what will happen. Sometimes telling them that this is for the good doesn't work. Then you have to talk about if you don't do this, it can affect your profitability. Now, I give them an example. If you do not uh, take care of your workforce, all right, they start absconding. You will have a problem with your workforce. Why is your workforce absconding? Maybe because they're not happy with their work. Why? Is it because they are being abused? Is it because they are not uh, the proper amenity? Are you not addressing the forced labor indicators? So you have to approach to them in a manner in which they understand. That's why you need to understand what's happening on the ground. You know, you need to understand what are the things that they're having problems with in order for you to help them to buy into this whole uh, you know, sustainability journey. So it is a very slow process. That's why I remember at the very beginning, I said it's mindset change. Once the people understand the importance of it, they will do it. But they have to be empowered to uh, accept it. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, we have a question from Wan Fen. Um, doctor, in your opinion, do you see audits for sustainability indicators becoming more common? And what are the challenges around such audits? Mm. Yes, of course, it is going to be more common. Uh, you know, the climate change is not something that will go away. So more and more, the requirement to measure your, uh, your greenhouse gas emission and your activities leading to its reduction or removal becomes important. It will be audited. Now, under uh, for IOI, our RSPO audit uh, undertakes to audit our greenhouse gas emission uh, based on the PAM JHG, which is also based on the greenhouse gas protocol. Uh, our uh, greenhouse gas emission are all audited when the auditors come over and do surveillance audit on our estates. Um, in our manufacturing, we have undertaken to use ISO 17064, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and, uh, and, and we will go towards having us audited based on that standard. So manufacturing is slightly different than plantation because uh, manufacturing has a different uh, activities, but uh, they are also going to be audited, external th third party audit. So this is really important because the at the basis of all that you want to uh, reduce, it has to be verified and that's your greenhouse gas change. Thank you, Doctor. Um, a question, we're coming back to the SMEs. Um, do you think the government should make ESG efforts mandatory for all companies, including the SMEs? Okay, I'm not sure about other sectors, but in the palm oil sectors, we have the Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil Certification. MSPO right now, 98% of all players in uh, MSPO is MSPO certified. So it's only one step, the next step, for uh, the MSPO to also include greenhouse gas emission. I think that's the next evolutionary state of the MSPO uh, standard. And I think in doing that, it will make the whole supply chain be part of the process. And since it's a mandatory um, uh, standard, I think, yes, I think the government would help you. Uh, because, for example, under the EU deforestation regulation, where they require geolocation of our uh, estates, that has already been incorporated into the MSPO trace. 
So that has already been done already. So now we know who, where our suppliers are. Okay. So the next step is just trying to see how do we go about incorporating greenhouse gas emission reduction? And that's where, again, a lot of awareness, you know, it took us a few years to get MSBO certified to be as far as 98%. So I think the next five years should be enough for us to also get everybody on board on the greenhouse gas. So that's why I'm quite optimistic that the SMEs would be. But this is only for the plantation. I'm not sure about the other sectors. So maybe you should go into the other sex. <laughs> Talk to the agencies. Yeah. We'll do. Maybe we get the other sectors on board and share their experience on this journey as well. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, a question by uh, an, an anonymous. Um, other than capacity building initiatives for your SMEs or this your supply chain counterparts, are there any types other types of assistance that IOI provides for them? Maybe it's some sort of financial assistance for them to transition into greener greener practices. I, I think the, the, the best thing that we can do with our suppliers, if they are very, very serious about it, is to be in collaboration with us. You know, we can collaborate, we can share with them our, our best practices in order for them to uh, be able to uh, be on board. Uh, for example, you know, uh, at one of our estates, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, in Sabah, we worked with the smallholders uh, and independent growers to be MSBO certified. And we, that's how we will approach it, you know. Uh, as I say, you know, when they are um, on board with what we are doing, it helps us to reduce our own uh, emission. So I think that it's not just about capacity building, but I think collaboration might be a good thing. Uh, and I think this is something that SMEs should see whether they can uh, collaborate with their customers uh, so that they will be part and parcel of the journey forward. I think that's okay. the best way to do it. Not necessarily okay. about financial. No? Yeah. Financial, yeah. it's just like, for example, you know, do you want to give a, a, a fisherman a fish or do you want to give them a fisherman tool, which is the, you know. Um, yeah. So And also, it also makes it more sustainable because they are already embedded in all how they want to adopt or practice it in, in this ESG journey. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Answer my, my answer the question for me. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, um, so this year, IOI itself must be a supplier. Can you share how do you report your emissions to your client, client other than via your annual report, as it also relates back to your client's scope tree? Mm. Um, you know, as I said, we have collaboration with our clients, uh, with our customers. Uh, you know, the relief project that we have to, to do restoration and uh, rehabilitation uh, along the uh, Kinabata is with our customer. And uh, so they are very well aware of our journey. And that makes them, that makes us, uh, you know, one of their preferred uh, customer, I mean, suppliers. Uh, so that what we are sharing with you right now is what we have been experiencing. Uh, you know, and, and, and the same thing with, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, most of the time we are very transparent. We report most of them into our NSS report because uh, this is one of the requirements of disclosure by the GRI because we, we report on the GRI. And, uh, and we are also, uh, you know, um, uh, trying to, with reference to ISSB, uh, in alignment with TCFD, all this is much better that we just report in one place rather than piecemeal, you know, reporting to one client or another. Um, except that, of course, if you have a collaboration. So most of the time, we fully report them in an analysis report. It makes it easier for our investors. It makes it easier for our customers, even our suppliers, to see uh, if everything is just reported very transparently, uh, transparently on, in our and also to report as well as on our website. So you should go to our website too. Thank, thank you so much, Doctor. Um, I'm mindful of the time and the fact that Doctor has kindly answered more than 20 questions from, from the floor. So maybe one last question uh, before we conclude the session. Hello, Dr. Serena. Um, in your experience, how has your clients, consumers, view the ESG work that IOI is currently taking? Any anecdotes that you can help share with us? Um, 
I have to say that I'm very happy with the way our uh, stakeholders have uh, looked at our journey going forward. Um, there is always a criticism, but there's always also uh, encouragement and uh, collaboration. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I find about our journey going forward, some of the difficult issues that we have faced, uh, um, like uh, in terms of forced labor, in terms of recruitment of workers. We've been working with ILO, for example, and uh, IOM to address this issue at a broader level. Uh, we have uh, been involved with the nation, National Action Plan uh, Against Forced Labor, uh, and a national uh, action plans uh, with about human rights. And this uh, journey has helped us uh, establish that uh, ESG or uh, sustainability is not going to go away. That is actually an advantage that a company has. Uh, you know, it makes into a company that is happy. And uh, we always have a saying, a happy company is a productive company. So that's something that, you know, going forward, uh, we believe that's very, very strongly. So I, I you know, I think that's uh, all I can say in terms of uh, our ESG journey. Thank you so much, Doctor. And with that, we've concluded the um, webinar session. Um, before I conclude the session, maybe Dr. Shian, you would like to have a final say about this whole ESG journey and maybe some key takeaways that you would like or the audience to live with. Okay. You know, um, right now the, the trend is ESG, but I would like to say that uh, at the heart of it all is the company's commitment towards ensuring the sustainability of the company. And that means uh, looking at your governance. Uh, so ESG is more or less the, you know, crystallizing your effort towards making your company sustainability. Governance is required. You need governance to be able to ensure accountability and transparency. Without governance, uh, any initiatives that you do on environmental and social, you know, it cannot be measured and it cannot be monitored. And then you cannot know whether it is successful or not. So make sure your governance is strong so that your E and your S is done very successfully and make sure it's embedded. Make sure your company as a whole embrace this journey of ESG. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Serena, for making the time here today and with your concluding remarks. Uh, with that, um, we are at the end of our session. On behalf of the audience and from Postal Malaysia, I would like to thank Dr. Serena again for making the time and sharing with us the journey with respect to ESG. Um, to the audience, um, apologies for not being able to go through all the, all the questions because of the time constraints. Um, we, ho we'll, we hope that uh, for, with the time that was provided, Dr. Serena has been able to address most, if not all, of your queries. Um, so we do hope to see all of you again in our next webinar series. For those who are not yet a participant in the PLC transformation program, um, we have our QR code um, flash up. Do feel free to register to be part of the PLC transformation program. Uh, we also have our guidebook, our five guidebooks that is also available in Busan Malaysia's website. Do go through them. One of them of the guidebook it does talk about on ESC on how companies can be part in this journey. Do have a look, uh, have a read and, see, and adopt that in your respective organization. And with that, um, let, again, thank you Dr. Serena and have a good day everyone. Bye. Bye.